All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the That's Not Real Trek podcast. My name is Scotty, also known as EVC, directly below me, the lovely short and sweet, also known as uh, the, 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 not the crazy one, I'm the crazy one. Um, yeah, I am so late today that um, she decided she was going to, uh, you know, like, pull, pull out the bull whip, like Indiana Jones, oh, shh. <laughs> I, I'm just fucking everything up today, man. All right. All uh, good. All good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, n- nobody died. Let's, let's leave it yeah. at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, looking back on uh, last week when we started uh, Strange New Worlds, did you have any further thoughts as to the, like the first two episodes, the feel of the the series, and all that? Uh, I haven't got too much of a feel for it yet. Uh, the first two episodes, I, I think, were really different from each other. Um, yes. So it'll be interesting to see kind of which uh, direction they, like, which kind of vibe they go with for most of the episodes. Um, but I think that I think that if they kind of go back and forth between those two styles, that might work kind of well. Uh, for the series overall. So, yeah, I'm curious to see what else we got coming up. I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to see at least a couple more styles okay. um, throughout this first season. Um, like, the you're, you're absolutely right. The first one was a lot more action-packed, a lot more of the Easter eggs, a lot more of the, um, <clears throat> the things that made you know, Star Trek great in the first place over all those different series. And then the second uh, episode was much more cerebral, um, uh, calmer, and and more of like a, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost like a Renaissance-type storytelling there where they were uh, trying to... uh, I think it was more like they were trying to talk about... uh, facets of humanity that have not been explored yet and and how that might incorporate into a, a different scenario that they haven't you know seen yet or or had a chance to adjust to so yeah i i think we're definitely going to see at least one or two more different styles in this where they're going to try to showcase the all of the different ways that this this could go um like, I think we're going to see, you know, at least one episode in the first ten that are, is more dark, um, you know, uh, more more towards the psychological thriller. And then we'll, we'll probably see some more comedy, especially on um, Spock's role. And, um, oh, who else? Who else is the comedy relief in there? Um, the uh, <clears throat> Nurse Chapel. Yeah, Nurse Chapel definitely seems to to fill well the the comic relief role, and she's got uh, a bit of spunk. <laughs> she yeah, and and she uh, she's got some crazy one liners, you know. Mm-hmm. So she's almost like uh, Scotty in uh, uh, in Star Trek two thousand nine, you yeah. know, and 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 even beyond that, not just not just J J Abrams movie, but I mean, you know, there was quite a few times Scotty played comic relief. Or data, mm-hmm. or you know, whoever else they're they're trying to fit that role. All right, so uh, our first episode tonight is uh, season one, episode three, "Ghosts of Illyria," and then uh, after that, uh, episode four, "Memento Mori." Here we go. Well, well, well. Captain Pike's got a lot of fucking secrets on his ship. <laughs> Say so. Boy, uh, we found out a lot this episode. Um, reveals all around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Slate would be happy. Um, yeah. So the first thing we found out, I, I I had to because I still don't have everybody's names quite right. Um, so the original first officer 
that uh, was then replaced by the standard number one that we had known previously. It's uh, her name is Lal Lan L A apostrophe A N, and then the last name Nuni and Singh. <clears throat> so we knew there was some kind of connection to Khan. And uh, we found out in this episode that Khan was an ancestor of hers. Um, and, and this was uh, all part and parcel with the fact that the uh, Illyrians were uh, never allowed uh, entry into the Federation because of their genetic engineering. So um, the thing that uh, could definitely help anybody who's watching this and wants to get more background on that there are uh, two books. Uh, let's see if I actually have them handy here on my bookshelf. Um, I don't think I do, but uh, and I can't remember who wrote them uh, specifically, but it is uh, The Eugenics Wars. I want to say Greg Cox is the, uh, the writer. Anyway, he, he took all of the backstory that we found out in Space Seed, uh, about the eugenics wars on Earth where humans were uh, dabbling in, in genetic engineering and experimentation and it ended up causing a war, this war between superhumans and Khan was one of them. So uh, at the end of the war, all of the um, genetically enhanced humans were put into sleeper ships. Uh, so Khan was on the SS Botany Bay along with his crew, and that's when the Enterprise found them all the, those years later. And uh, then we find out uh, now in this episode that this, uh, this crew member is a uh, direct descendant of the superhumans. So she is genetically modified herself just as a descendant, but not through any means of, uh, uh, you know, her... Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? She didn't want it to happen. She just was saddled with this as, you know, part of her origin. And, uh, and she faced this as a child, the, the hatred of, um, you know, because of people that had said, okay, genetic engineering is a bad thing because it caused this war that, you know, almost destroyed humanity. Um, and, and therefore we reject all genetic engineering. Oh, here's this genetically engineered person here. Let's, let's just beat the shit out of her or, you know, make fun of her endlessly and make her hate what she is. So that's, that's where Noonie and Singh is coming from. Uh, and then, oh, we're going to visit this planet of uh, the Illyrians who were genetic engineering people. Uh... All, but they're all wiped out now, and we don't know what happened to them, and we're trying to find out, um, and it turns out uh, later we find out that they they were drawn into the ion storm uh, by the light. They, they were literally trying to chase the lightning and somehow got, you know, uh, slaughtered then and transformed into the 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 ghost-like beings that almost instantly reminded me of the TNG uh, episode Power Play with the uh, supposed crew of the Essex taking over Data and um, Troy and uh, uh, O'Brien. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, yeah. And I don't know if it was like necessarily an Easter egg for that, but it, it definitely had some of those notes. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we find out uh, the big reveals, well, the first of the big reveals, that uh, number one, whose uh, full name is Una, uh, U-N-A, and then her last name, also a hyphenated name, Chin Riley, exactly like it sounds, but we'll just call her number one. Uh, <clears throat> she's an Illyrian. What the fuck? <laughs> Um, so how did you, uh, how did you perceive that, that kind of revelation there in this episode that, you know, this, this thing that was kind of hated in the Federation because of the genetic engineering aspect, she's been hiding that and, uh, apparently well enough to be able to enter 
not only the Federation, but Starfleet and, and work her way up to Commander, hiding her origins all along. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, surprising, for sure. Uh, and then they have that little note in there where, where he was like, hey, how could you pick me up like that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> but, it's all good. You, you know, you had to figure it would come out eventually that that she yeah. is this, and, and um, clearly Pike doesn't care, so... Well, and I gotta wonder, like, you know, if if they were even simply trying to catalog her ID upon entry into Starfleet, you know, where what she passed herself off of as if if it was an Illyrian, you know, um, clearly there was potential for maybe she, you know, was genetically modified into uh, something resembling something else enough to pass off that and get by and then keep the secret. Um, Cage says, well, you know, it kind of makes sense. You think, like, the major differences between um, original series and TNG, Picard was all about order, Kirk represented chaos, playing fast and loose with the rules, it would make complete sense if Pike is similar. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second here, uh, because there's <laughs> there's far more to this episode that was revealed. Uh, um, but the, the interesting aspect of um, how uh, not only did she hide this, um, but uh then was maybe going a step further in um trying to hide in plain sight almost you know and um uh, you saw there at the end that uh, Nunian Singh was uh, uh very upset uh that this was hidden from her in particular uh given her history and uh what all is going on with uh you know that from her perspective um, and, uh, and then Pike at the end, uh, basically as his, his, uh, common badass self just saying, yeah, that, we're, we're not going to worry about this shit. You know, that's, we'll that, figure we'll, it out. We'll deal with that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and granted, you know, there's something to be said because essentially number one saved the ship single-handedly. She <laughs> your, your cat looks genetically modified back there. God, he's such a brat. <laughs> but um, yeah, it seemed like Pike. You know, he's he's recognizing this that that she single handedly saved the Enterprise, and did so because she was genetically modified. And right. and and he's he's saying, okay, that's it. You know. Screw what the, screw what Starfleet says or the Federation. We're 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 no we're throwing out the rule book now, mm -hmm. and we're just basically going to do what, what we feel is is right on this. And maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but <clears throat> she was willing to throw away her whole career. I think it's definitely something they're going to revisit. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> all right, come, come here, cat. Quit fucking around. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> nope. Whoop. There you go. Whoa. All right. <laughs> um. So yeah, uh, definitely could revisit that. We certainly never got any of this kind of background story in the original series. I mean, granted, she was only yeah. in one, maybe two episodes the way that was portrayed. Um. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll have to see where they take that now because that's that's set a very serious precedent in how Captain Pike deals with things and how Number One deals with things, and and that's definitely going to come into play at least partially later, I would think. Um, and then the uh, other big reveal that almost seemed like it was kind of tacked onto the story. Hammer in the middle of the, the thing went into uh, the uh, sick bay and was trying to track down some kind of engineering issue and then it was revealed at the end of the uh, sh um, episode that Dr. Mabanga was actually holding his terminally ill daughter in transporter buffer yeah uh, yeah that, that that was that was very unexpected what did you what did you think of that 
I mean, I kind of like thought of a uh, frozen Walt Disney uh, when he started to mention that, <laughs> and it's like, man, I mean, I guess as a parent and as a doctor, you would do whatever you could to try to find a cure, and you know, this is his last resort. Um, it's kind of messed up that he like rematerializes her and is just like reading a story <laughs> like nothing's wrong at all and then what does he say like okay go to sleep and back in the buffer you know it's kind of like um that didn't transport her with you yeah does she know like when she's i mean i guess i guess in the buffer she <laughs> just is uh i i knew in there and <laughs> i knew that was coming because there were some youtube videos that i had watched prior to this to get a little bit of information on where some of the stories were going. Mm -hmm. um, I did not expect that they were actually going to show her, like he was going yeah. to dematerialize her and tell her a bedtime story. And, 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 and yeah, that was brought up in chat. I, I'm, I'm wondering as well, does he just do this willy nilly? Like, Oh, I think I'll see my daughter this evening. Let's pull her out of limbo. You know, um, in, in fact, I, I, almost would would be potentially calling that um a a huge fault in dr mabanga's character because let's say she has this terminally ill uh you know this terminal illness and she he the, the whole reason he put her in suspended animation is because uh, he's trying to find a cure. Okay, I could see that, and that makes sense to a certain degree, but then you don't pull her out of it just to s tell a bedtime story and spend some time with her, because that means the disease is going to progress in the time that she's out of the transporter. So right. what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> yeah, and also, like, all the other people that, you know, have these diseases and things like you know it's because it's his daughter right but all these other people he's just letting you know nature take its course so uh yeah definitely an interesting turn of events there <laughs> yeah so so it's it, it certainly seems like dr mabanga is is severely compromised mm -hmm. in that regard and um that could not only potentially affect things later, you know, where he's maybe putting the interests of his daughter ahead of the crew, uh, and, and that causes him to, you know, not only be compromised, but, like, maybe cause somebody else's death, and then he's got to deal with that. I mean, we also didn't get a lot of backstory or information on Dr. Mabanga in the original series either, what happened to him, why he wasn't there. I mean, clearly it was almost always um, Dr. McCoy. And I think we had, uh, I can't remember who it was in, in the original thing with uh, um, Captain Pike, the, you know, the doctor that offers him the, the dry, you know, the martini. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember, uh, Boyd. Boyd is his name, Dr. Boyd. Uh, so I don't know if that's going to come into play anywhere else, but... Clearly, there's. It almost seems like they're setting Doctor Mabanga up to not be a part of the crew at some point because he has some kind of ethical failure. Yeah, maybe. Either way, we now have number one keeping this secret of Doctor mm -hmm. Mabanga. I, 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 I would like to think that maybe Nurse Chapel knows because she seems to be a, a real close confidant. Dr. Mabanga, but even Pike didn't know. Right. Okay, yeah, Pike didn't know that number one was an Illyrian. That was a very well-kept secret, but at least that isn't necessarily dangerous to the crew. Yeah, um, everybody could have been uh, turned into lightning bolts here. Yeah. Because the <laughs> the pattern buffer, the, uh, the filters or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the other thing that surprised me is Hemmer. 
uh, in the middle, so he was infected. I was thinking that maybe he would not be infected because he's blind, and I thought mm -hmm. maybe that that maybe had something to do with oh, it. You know, they're talking about nice. how you know the the virus travels on light. Okay, so clearly mm -hmm. he then got infected, and um, he was trying to transport a piece of the planet's mantle onto the ship so that he could feel the warmth on his skin <laughs> because he's blind, yeah. right? And it's just like, oh, uh, yeah, number one's like, it's a thousand degrees, you moron! You know? <laughs> uh, so that I thought that was hilarious, but yeah, that, that surprised me too. I was thinking maybe Hammer was going to kind of not be able to be affected by it, but clearly he was. Yeah. And um, you know what also this uh, episode reminded me of is um, the the Naked Truth and the Naked Now, where mm -hmm. you essentially had almost the entire crew incapacitated by this virus and one yeah. person working feverishly to try to save the ship. And uh, everybody else is just, you know, in la-la land. <laughs> going off the rails. <laughs> yeah, going off the rails. That's exactly right. What did they do? Uh, the one at the what did they do? They turned down the environmental controls because they were too hot, so they all froze. Uh, yeah, that was in uh, yeah. the Naked Now, <laughs> um, and they found actually that happened in both. They you know one of yeah. the they they get in the shower uh, and mm -hmm. freeze to death because the temperature controls are are just all screwy or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the uh, man. <laughs> too many things that that can go wrong on the ship apparently we got to fix shit we, yeah. we got to make sure all our ducks are in a row and captain pike's got to find out about these secrets man yeah yeah <laughs> all right uh anything else on that episode before we move on no i think uh pretty much i've got all that there okay all right, then our next episode is episode four. I do not know anything about this episode. It's uh, called Memento Mori. Here we go. All right. Well, the uh, Enterprise got the shit beat out of her in that episode, man. Yeah, it was really not uh, looking good there at the no. beginning. <laughs> lots, of, lots of plot holes in the hole. And, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so I, I knew because of uh, Noonien Singh's uh, background uh, where the colony that she was at uh, was destroyed by the Gorn. And uh, we also saw there um, a love interest for her that apparently did not survive. Um, and uh, I, I think, yeah, well, I mean, I had uh, gathered some information and I, I knew some of that was coming. I just didn't know where it was. So that this was obviously the episode. But um, <clears throat> I found it interesting that there... It seemed like in, in some of the info that I had seen previously that there was supposed to be something in the storyline about vengeance and about how Noonien Singh was, you know, dealing with this on a vengeance level of, of trying to take revenge for what the Gorn did to her colony. And that didn't seem to come into play nearly as much. So unless I'm mistaken in the information that I saw earlier that may still yet be something coming up because she seemed to deal with that pretty well. How did, uh, how did you see her reaction to all of this? Yeah, I think she, uh, dealt with it, uh, really well in considering that she was seeing like kind of visions or mm -hmm. I, whatever it was like shadows, flashbacks, whatever you would want to call it of, um, you know, the, the person that she had lost from the attack um and it almost seemed like it was weird because it was like pike didn't want to listen to her and right. 
knowing I, I'm he knows her background. So I would think that like he would be like, okay, like looking to her immediately for advice rather than um just kind of her having to convince him really to to listen and <laughs> do what she advised. Um, yeah, that, but I, I thought she dealt with it really well. Yeah, that one scene in the ready room where um she she was essentially like almost pouring her heart out to him as to, you know, what she felt about these uh Gorn and um he took it in stride, but yeah, it was almost like a convincing had to happen, except for the the beginning part where, uh, and and this is one thing that I've always uh, liked about Star Trek is that <clears throat> you got a captain that trusts his crew or her crew. Somebody makes a call to the bridge and says, you don't know anything about what the fuck I'm talking about, but raise the shields now. And the captain thinks about it for about uh, 1.2 seconds and then says, raise shields. And and that moment of it, I I really enjoyed that scene where Noonien Singh called up to the bridge and Pike just sprung into action and did what she said. Um, and and not only were her instincts correct, but it it really... Uh, did its part to save the ship, even though they were in peril then for the rest of the episode. Yeah. Um, I, th I thought it was kind of interesting that while they were docked with this uh, survey ship or transport or whatever it was, uh, they couldn't raise shields. And I thought... Well, first of all, we've heard a couple of times in Star Trek episodes and things about, like... Uh, extending shields around another ship. Mm -hmm. um, there's even an episode of Enterprise where uh, the two ships actually back up to each other and merge their their warp shell and their shields around each other. So, and that that's supposed to take place a hundred years before this episode. So, so it seems to me that that was a bit of technology that we could have used there. Just yeah. uh, raise the shields, but extend it around the transport. Right. Um, <laughs> or emergency beam everybody that's in the tunnel or on the ship off of the ship and, you know, shut it down, you know, whatever it is they have to do. So it seemed like they were kind of like not quite as Johnny on the spot there in resolving the issue. Um, and because of that, then number one was... Um, in, in the surgery, um, which, you know, okay, so, so now she's facing this, this peril and, and they had to work through this, this medical story where, you know, okay, you need the plasma because you're about to lose a shit ton of blood and, oh yeah, this person over here needs to give it to them, that's an order, you know, and, yeah. and they didn't even revisit it until the end, the very end there, and we find out what happened to her. Um, so what did you think of that whole scenario with the, the peril that number one was facing? I, I honestly thought that maybe they were, I was like, are they actually going to kill her in the fourth episode of the series? Cause that would be a damn bold move. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so for a minute, uh, I thought that's the route they were going to go, but you know, remains yeah, so to be seen what's going to happen to her. Yeah, so we had the funeral, uh, essentially, in the beginning, or the captain, you know, giving his remarks. Uh, so we knew somebody was going to die. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, that that's also uh, a nice trope that has been revisited many, many times in Star Trek. Uh, you know, we know somebody's going to die, we just don't know who it is. I don't know, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it turned out to be uh, seven red shirts this episode. Um mm -hmm. And, and three civilians. I'm wondering, uh, I don't recall, you know, there was, I think I wanted to say there was like, you know, 425 or 435 crew members on the original Enterprise, but I don't recall civilians unless they were talking about, like, the civilians that were on the transport ship or something. Oh, yeah, could be. Could be, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so... 
so they they definitely use that well-known trope of of you know we know somebody's gonna die we just don't know who it is and then you know playing <laughs> with your emotions it might be number one because yeah we've never seen her into captain kirk's enterprise right um so what happened to una chin riley what happened mm. to Noonien Singh, what happened to Ortega's and Hemmer and, and even uh, Dr. Mabanga. We don't know what their fates are moving into Kirk's Enterprise, aside from Mabanga being on two episodes and all that. So yeah. um, it's, it's hard to say, you know, they're, they're, they're walking this thin line between we've got characters we know have to survive like even pike even though eventually he's gonna face this fate where he's mangled and in, in a uh, wheelchair for the rest of his life yeah. we know that's coming and he knows that's coming now but now they're walking this line between the people that we know have to survive to be able to move on in the next series and mm -hmm. the ones that we don't know about and how, how they're playing this, this action role almost to say, okay, now we're going to make you wonder what happens here, you know. So it was a really interesting episode, I thought. Um, the action was uh, very nice. Uh, I thought it was a shame that we really didn't get to see a good look at a Gorn. Oh, I was glad that they didn't show the Gorn. <laughs> Yeah, I like I I appreciate that they're like holding it back. Okay. Because we're going to, you know, instantly we're going to compare it to the Gorn from the original series. Right. And it's it's going to be and I think I think that was a very um like strategic move on their part to not show. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we got just the, the, the slightest glimpse in, in the uh, flashback scenes where where Spock is melding with her. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, they did show uh, a CGI Gorn in Enterprise. Um, oh, so whenever, whenever we get to that, which, you know, if we're going to continue with that uh, plan, uh, we would probably get to that in, um, I want to say, the fall of 2024 so not too far off um because i it it, like it. <laughs> yeah if you uh you haven't seen enterprise i've seen it the whole series it's only four seasons uh several times mm -hmm. and i re i really enjoy it um mm -hmm. most people after uh, voyager and ds9 they're like yeah i don't know about this enterprise i don't know <laughs> I don't think we're going to count that as real Star Trek, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, and that's that seemed to be where a lot of people fell off the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they do show a CGI Gorn in... Uh, it's actually a, a Mirror episode in uh, Enterprise. Uh, and they have um, Scott Bakula as Captain Archer uh, fighting this CGI Gorn. And it was okay. It wasn't great, but I mean, it certainly looked better than than the one in the original series. Oh yeah. That that you know the the guy was probably sweating his ass off in that rubber suit in the middle yeah. of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um. So uh, I, I, what I wanted to ask you is how how did you say. <laughs> How did you see um, this this entrance of the Gorn as now a uh, because they were talking about it at the end of the episode the um, the fact that the Gorn have not been spotted or seen or dealt with that far into Federation territory as of yet so this is a new thing uh now and and this this taking place i would say approximately uh six to seven years before kirk encounters the gorn yeah um so how do you see this uh uh being a thing <laughs> uh 
how do you see this being a thing now that the Federation has to deal with this this incursion by the Gorn? Yeah, I mean, uh, they're clearly more powerful, and uh, they have some. Oh, God. get down, you! I'm gonna hold you, and then you can't do anything. Um, and they and they clearly have some advanced uh, fighting tactics, so they're going to have to figure out a way to adapt and overcome because it seems like uh, they haven't even come at them full force and they were already whooping their ass with that little baby ship mm. and then the big ship comes and it's like oh god right. like <laughs> what is that one gonna do so they're gonna have to come up with something and uh then we'll see i mean it seemed like the, in the original series if i'm not mistaken it was just that one on the planet by itself so then we're gonna have kind of maybe we'll get to see the whole evolution of or de-evolution of, you know, the Gorn as this big, powerful foe, and then the Gorn alone on this planet by himself, right. you know. It, yeah, <laughs> you know, if I recall, Kirk. <laughs> yeah, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, Kirk and, and the single Gorn were just stranded on the planet together, and then mm -hmm. we're duking it out. Yeah. Um and, you know, the other thing that came to mind in that, when we're talking about threats to the Federation and Starfleet, I mean, of course, we've got uh, the Dominion, uh, you know, we've, we've got the Klingons in, in various uh, forms and places and, and interactions. You've got the Romulans, the Ferengi, all of these uh, different enemies that they faced over the years. The one that came to mind when I was watching this episode was the Tholians. You've got the Tholian web from the original episode, uh, original series, um, where basically their their thing was you've got I don't know you know however many tiny ships and they start building this energy web around a bigger ship and then they you know try to bring the web in and and crush the ship. Um, and that also was explored in an episode of Enterprise where they face the Tholians. Um, but you, and, and in Enterprise, we actually get to see one because in the original series, you never see it. You just see their ships out there trying to work together to destroy the Enterprise. Um, so that reminded me a lot of this, that it's almost like a faceless enemy where, yeah, you're going to face off in space and, and you're going to see their ship and you're going to see what their ship is capable of, but you never see what the actual species looks like. Yeah, let alone no communication between the two. No, right. like, you know, yeah, they just open attack. a hailing frequency. No, we're just full on, we're yeah. going to fight each other. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I saw a lot of similarity, similarities between that, and I don't know, I, in fact, I don't think that in Strange New Worlds they ever visit the Tholians, but uh, there's definitely some similarities with that where, you know, you, you've got a Federation and a Starfleet that's trying to explore space and make contact with new civilizations and new worlds and all this, and they're doing so on good faith. And then... How many times are they running into uh, a new species that is just hostile, outright yeah. hostile, and mm -hmm. and they're almost taken off guard or caught off guard, and then they have to recoup, and then they have to reinvent, <laughs> and and you know Pike says at the end of the episode, well next time we'll be ready. Why the fuck weren't you ready at the beginning of the episode? You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, How are you gonna be ready? You don't have any uh, torpedoes left. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's and that's another theme that Enterprise uh, explores quite a bit, and and at that point it made sense because uh, Enterprise is um, humans first doing deep space exploration. They've been warp capable since Zephram Cochran, and and now it's several years later, and they're ready to actually start doing deep sp space exploration, and they aren't ready for what they go out there and meet. And, and, and it takes them, you know, a minute to go, oh, yeah, maybe we better prepare ourselves yeah. for for what these possibilities are out there. Well, it seems like, you know, they they still haven't learned, though. Mm -hmm. You know, we face the Gorn 
in a major interaction for the first time and they are not prepared for it or at the very least they're caught off guard yeah you know or or how about when picard first encounters the borg in yeah. in uh, encounter at far point mm -hmm. um you know and and only at the behest of q but still you're not prepared for any of this you no. know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not even a little right so all right um anything else i forgot about that episode no i was trying to think of that uh that guy that was with lieutenant kyle there at the end if he was like a character that we know but i don't think he i think he was just kind of like a red shirt that was the first time and last time we've seen him yeah no yeah i, I don't think it yeah. was anybody they really put any thought into just all red shirts mm -hmm. um yeah kyle they're 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 definitely showing a lot more of him you know than ever was he was only briefly mentioned and seen a couple of times in uh in the original series mm -hmm. um so it's not it, 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 it you know what he seems like now uh, kyle the way they're they're working him in seems like o'brien in the in the first two three uh seasons of tng you know mm -hmm. like he was just this random He's guy there. that we bring in every yeah. once in a while when we need a <laughs> transporter room scene or something like that and yeah maybe we'll bring him in later as as more of a an element mm -hmm. so yeah um the only other thing i can think of is i i as soon as the uh shuttle bay shut down and they're like he's like uh, there there's a bunch of shit blocking the door isn't there and she's like yeah and i'm like first of all maybe try climbing over the shit uh yeah. and and barring that is there only literally only one entrance to the shuttle bay what about jeffrey's oh, tubes what about you know all the <laughs> Once again, we're reliant on the transporter, and it's down. Sure. You know. <laughs> Maybe that's why they put the Jeffrey's tubes in the other ship. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Well, that's uh, pretty much it then. Uh, next week, we have uh, Spock Amok is mm. episode five, where we're definitely going to be revisiting to Pring. And uh, now this all comes uh, prior to Spock uh, dealing with his Pon Far. So uh, I, I do know, uh, based off of the little bit that I saw, uh, that they are going to revisit that whole battle scene in a mock time. Uh, and, and they're going to work that into the episode. I don't want to say how they're going to do it because I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, okay. But it, it, it should be very interesting, and we're definitely going to get some more backstory on T'Pring and uh, what their relationship is. And uh, I don't know anything about the next episode, number six, uh, Lift Us Where Suffering Cannot Reach. So we will see what that is next week. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Okay.